off and running on the uh, first day of Preakness Week here in South Florida. Breaking out the big guns, as we say. Tracking out to Pete Aiello. Jason Blewett alongside. A little rain in the area, Pete, this morning. But it does seem like things have cleared up outside as we settle in for a 10-race card. It's a little bit ironic. We had a couple of races that really had the look of a deep Olympic-sized pool in terms of the depth of the race. Mm. And I think that uh, we're into the kiddie pool in those races now, though, as the uh, level of difficulty with the scratches got a little bit easier here today. And that includes of course the first race which uh, certainly isn't the only and it is an off the turf affair but there's some quality and talent to be had in that upcoming quartet in the Thursday first and certainly that is a theme throughout the next few days not just here at Gulfstream but especially about 1100 miles north of us up at Pimlico Racecourse of course a Preakness 144 drawn last night you've got a field of 13 a baker's dozen in this 144th Preakness the biggest field Pete since back in 2011 and no matter who you like no matter what your opinion is you can't go wrong spending Preakness Day right here at Gulfstream Park. That's absolutely accurate we have an early post time of 12 30 we have a great party going on on the third floor in the Flamingo Room we'll have our great spe our drink specials throughout the plant as well and if you need reservations we've got you covered 954-457-6201. Zero one, my good man, right there. No, hope to see everybody out here. And just do note, tomorrow afternoon, you'll have uh, advanced full card, uh, advanced wagering available uh, for Saturday's Preakness uh, Day festivities at Pimlico. And uh, do note, there is a Black Eyed Susan Preakness uh, double, which always seems like... I'll be like, involved in uh, that. Yeah, that does seem like for doubles, and I get it's not a pick five or a pick four, it does seem like people really like that Black Eyed Susan Preakness double. Well, it takes uh, the excitement of both days of course Friday and the being the black eyed Susan afternoon and then if you get alive in that you have a whole day to excite yourself as to what your will pays are and your possibilities for the Preakness so I always like that the Oaks Derby double ties in the two big races mm. in Kentucky and the uh, black eyed Susan did, did a Preakness double ties in the two big races in Maryland all right a lot of Preakness talk coming your way with you and I over the next uh, few days uh, it'll be Pete and I on the early show as the uh, rest of the gang again about and I timed it out or uh, figured it out. About 9,000 furlongs from here at Gulf <laughs> Street. I got issues the Pimlico race course. We do however have uh, Uncle B who we've seen lately even coming to mind as a horse like Royal Squeeze. We've had a number of solid uh, former claimers turned stakes winners uh, specifically exclusively here in South Florida and I think Uncle B is very much a part of that conversation over the last 12 to say 18 months he is a star potentially in this first race, but the million dollar question is, will he be able to dirt today on the main track? I'd love to know if anyone has a conclusive answer to that question. He's only ran on the main track one time, and I guarantee you that he's a better racehorse now than he was then. That being said, he has a loose on the lead to a horse to catch in number two CV. Now, he will not play part, nor will his cast of a four in today's opener play part in the jackpot seven-figure carryover Rainbow Six. You saw the tagline, we have not paid out, and this is a meet well over the six-week mark, we have not paid out the jackpot in its entirety, nearly $1.1 in the kitty, which looks pretty good. Yeah, and I think there'll be multiple winning tickets sold with the races coming off the turf here today, but that doesn't mean anything to me. Mm -hmm. Some people get a little hot under the collar when you say that, but the reality of the situation is it's still pays more than it should the parlay is always less or yeah always less than what it actually pays yeah no doubt so there's there's definitely value to be had in the rainbow six and a card like this what's wrong with having it four or five times i'll take it i'll take it as well my friend try to build up some ammunition for the uh for the weekend and we'll dive right in and that's a perfect segue of course right into the opening of pick five on this sealed and good off the turf thursday may 16th you can uh, you're in the hot seat here my friend and we've got a 24 dollar 
early five to start the new week. Yeah, I'm going to do the ultimate horse player no-no and go all but one in the first leg and uh, use the two, four, and five. I'm going to use Uncle B out of respect. I think the two's loan speed, and you like the five, mm -hmm. so I can afford to do this for only $24 because some of the later races I whittled down with some confidence. The second race is not included in that statement, however. I'm four deep in the race. I'll use the one, two, three, and four and hope I can beat your horse, the six. I think the four goes favorite. I think he's a likely vulnerable favorite. The solid single comes in the third race, Alyssa's Secret. In my mind, she moves up with a little moisture in the ground today as that usually lends itself to horses on or near the lead. I think she fits that bill, so we'll single there. Two deep in the fourth, the three northern appears to be one of the controlling speed, the other being number six, Be a Hero. To me, they are a league above the rest and led by my cowboy underneath. And then in the fifth leg, this is a two-horse contest only for me, and both of them have questions to answer when moving to the main track. Number seven, Escondra. Number eight, unlock the potential. I'll go for a $24 play. If I get by leg three, I'm feeling pretty good. Now, you've got, as far as your top pick goes, a horse that looks, I mean, looks like he checks all the applicable boxes in the number two CV in this upcoming Thursday first over a an off the turf race of course over a good sealed main track uh, looked a, just a little too obvious for my my taste in this first but what do you like about this speedster well he should be controlling speed but a couple of things also to note happy alter doesn't go to the claim box very much he, he has a pretty good operation going and he does it with homebreds a lot of the time so he must have saw something at least from a value standpoint to reach in and claim this horse for fifty thousand dollars if this horse keeps his form that he did when he was in the Kelly Breen barn, he was probably a good investment mm -hmm. for $50,000, a la what you were talking about with Royal Squeeze, where horses who run for a $50,000 tag in the winter can be overnight stakes caliber in the summer. So might be a good investment for this uh, for this guy in Happy Alter. He certainly doesn't need any introduction in the resume department. And CV doesn't either, as his last race over the main track was an easy win in gate-to-wire fashion at Keeneland. So I'm not reinventing the wheel here. Speed is the weapon of choice. Yeah, no doubt. I have, even though I pick slightly against CV, there are a number of races that I've got speed horses on top throughout the day. And look, what it comes down to with the five take command is uh, the way I drew up the race. He's going to be up close and most likely tracking in that second spot. You're not talking about the same horse, but I'm encouraged with how well Garter and Ty ran here. Fresh in my mind in the big drama against Royal Squeeze, considering that was a field against older horses. And you know Take Command just got no pace last time out. Yeah, absolutely. And he is a horse that is rounding into form. The form cycle appears to be headed in the upward direction, which is always a good thing. And you have a horse like Uncle B who's going to take money by reputation. Mm -hmm. So the two and four will take 85% of the play here. If you can topple them, you're looking at a huge overlay in the uh, multi-leg bets. Yeah, we're clearly fans of Uncle B, but he's going to beat us in the first if he can transfer that solid and excellent turf form overall to the main track. Just uh, too big a question. It's rare to see... It feels like most horses at his level, they can do one or the other. They just can't do them both, right? Well, there's been some exceptions to I that. know there's some exceptions to the rule, but those switch hitters at a very high, you know, even summertime overnight stakes or three or four other than allowance level, just seems like you're good on dirt or you're good on turf. It doesn't really mesh. Two notable exceptions for South Florida historians, Wurtz and Wycappy both come to mind as horses that could run as well on the dirt as they did on the grass. And, of course, they have both been retired for many many years so that really in terms of timeliness isn't relevant at all but i do love the memory on you my friend listen you have story time i, I know. story time absolutely too. no i love hearing about these south florida warriors of uh, years past with the young pete aiello at gulfstream and across town at called a race course uh three and up three lifetime uh, 6250 claimers are up next my friend and you would uh, ask me before we started the show who do you like in the second because i think essentially there's a, a a trap a bad favorite in that race and i i knew who you were talking about and thankfully at least as far as ribbing on this show i didn't pick that horse i'm going to take organic jenny just hoping look you got a near 40 percent barn and i think they're just saying look i think we paid a little too much for him i'm hoping he shows some life as he gets his claiming price cut in half the real story of the race though is the four arts table who i mean when you look at that last race yeah he was game but boy on on buyer that race came up unbelievably fast yeah and almost too fast in my opinion mm -hmm. and i also think that arts table won that race last time out 
luckily, because number uh, the horse that was second that day, Zalza, he's in later today, and we're probably, I think we're going to show his race. I didn't remember if I wrote that down or not, but he ran him weird. He got mm -hmm. left at the start and circled way wide, looked hopelessly defeated. Then he looked like he was going to blow right by and ended up getting beat a neck. So all things considered, I would very much caution against taking too short a price on Art's table in the second, especially think, since I think the controlling speed is down inside in Ebrio. Now, if you go back two races, you have to throw that race out. It's on grass. Go three races back. He's running against Mystery Witness. Way tougher field than he'll run against today and last time you said well what happened last time Petey ran third beaten eight lengths yes he did however he did it against older horses mm -hmm. Dr. Harlan would come back to run well yep. and a horse who I thought had no chance after the, his last effort was Travi Boy who drifted way out to the center and just looked tired he came back to run really really well and both of those horses were forwardly placed so Ebriel back in against his friends today I'll take a shot on the inside All right, Pete very much in the corner of one Wire to wire speed with CV and Ebrio in both halves of the early double. As we move on, we've got your in race number three in a scheduled dirt race for three year old Phillies at six furlongs. We've got your early pick five single, and for good reason. I mean, there is a lot to like about the number four Lisa's Secret. And of course, topping the list, arguably, is this last out victory from April 19th, in which she was off the claim and paid a good price for leading trainer Safi Joseph Jr. She, when it comes down to it, Pete, if I was to ask you, is she flat out too classy, too fast, too good for this field? You clearly think she is. I think so, yeah. I don't know about clearly because yeah, I, I do I do think that her last race was really, really good. I am worried about a little bounce ball scenario here with Alyssa's Secret. She made a major step forward when making the barn change and it's not like she's going from low profile connections either. He claimed this horse off of Jorge Navarro and moved her up 16 points on the buyer scale. She run, you just saw it, she won with something in the tank there uh, and I really don't think she has to run any different than she did last time to pose for the mm -hmm. picture here. And the other thing I like about her is she has some tactics speed and at least relative to the other horses who are in here with speed she's the outside of them yeah. I love that I want to that way you have options you can sit or stalk no doubt and you perhaps don't have to take any of that kickback and you just you can just get into the race on your own accord and get into a groove on your own without like a horse like talk back on the rail who's going to have to really be sent away from there and the other potential speed I'm assuming you think is the three Corey yeah, yeah I think so and I'm, Prado doesn't send so we'll see how that works out the one caveat and maybe a chink in the Alyssa's secret armor her one race with moisture in the racetrack was awful I hope that was just an anomaly that was the day that she got claimed mm. from her previous connections I think she's a better horse now than she was then so I'll give her a pass for that and although there's a lot of racing left to be had pretty tight in the trainer standings here with Safi one victory in front of both Ralph Nix and uh, Joe Orsino at nine and eight but Safi seems like the the hottest name per se I mean even on Saturday he's got a horse a first uh, by uncaptured for E5 racing he's picked up some horses for Mike Dove and Mataket stables I mean you've seen I mean the evolution and it's still very much playing itself out but I mean the strides he's made in terms of just barn size and, and, and quality has really been on notice. A lot more guns, a lot more ammo, and a lot bigger ammo for mm -hmm. him. So good, 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 good on him. He deserves yeah. it. Yeah, no doubt. Has been a consistent winner since I moved here two years ago and even longer than that. Now, the uh, fourth race, uh, I happen to agree with you, Pete. You're too deep here as we cut back to five and a half on the dirt, and you're too deep in your early pick five with the three northern who is going out for a trainer who is six for 16 here at the meet in Elizabeth Dole. We've also got the six be a hero who may be the one that trips out. And why don't we get right into the stat here in the what have you done for me lately? You know, this is the kind of barn and Angel Kiros who, I mean, going into the primetime winter championship season, I think he lays low. And it's a tough meet for more of the mom and pop blue collar outfits. This to me, though, shows that perhaps he was gearing up for the spring, if you will, maybe April and May at Gulfstream Park as his horses have noticeably been running big. And I think this horse is just going to get the trip here. I have a problem, though, with Be a Hero in terms of putting him on top, and I'm going to take a shot against a horse I used in my pick five in Be a Hero, and it's twofold, and you can, I welcome your opinion on both. First of all, you're getting claimed from Jorge Navarro. That, in my mind, is always a little bit of a red flag. Mm -hmm. But the more worrisome problem for me is you claim this horse at the end of March. We don't lack opportunities to get in the entry box here at Goldstream.
Dream Park. Why do you sit on this horse so long, especially as a nine-year-old? Maybe there's something amiss. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. I just I can't take it on faith that Be a Hero is going to be as good no, as I his last you. race. No, was. the layoff, the Navarro thing is whatever per se. Not, I don't love that. I'm more, and I hadn't thought about it, having about 45 days between starts, and we do run a bevy, the, a bevy of these 6250 claimers. Again, he likes a wet track. He may get the trip, but a good point with you regarding the layoff. You don't have to worry about a layoff. In fact, quite the contrary for the three Northern, who ran about a month ago and is coming back as he brings good speed to the party and is right outside Pachanga Park. Yeah, he, he ran awful last time. I've been, my, my goal is to get him right to the lead here. If Iro Rendon is aggressive as I hope he is, I think we'll get to the front and see what we have. But his last race for the new barn is not a race that I want to key off of. But that being said, relative to the other competitors, we're taking shots at these top two horses we used. Go back and try to find somebody to topple them. It's not an easy game. No, it's a tough field and uh, just an overall tough puzzle to get ultimately too cute with. As we take a little time out, we'll have the Rainbow Six. We'll talk Stronic Five and a walk down memory lane with Smarty Jones and the Preakness coming up now. more from Eddington. He's not getting it yet. And there goes Rock Hard 10, who rolls up on the outside and around the far turn. Mike Smith is giving Smarty Jones the rail. He remains well off the rail with three furlongs to go on Lionheart. An inviting opening on the inside for Smarty Jones. And Rock Hard 10 is uncoiling that massive stride of his. He is third as they come to the top of the stretch. And as they hit the top of the stretch, Smarty Jones has taken the lead. It is Smarty Jones in front. Lionheart doing his best, but he's second. And rock hard tennis third as they come into the final form of the 129th pace net. And it is Smarty Jones. He's pulling away. He's pulling away to win impressively here. Rock hard ten second on the inside. He's going to win by a colossal margin. Here is Smarty Jones. He wins the Preakness by a dozen lengths. He remains undefeated. And it's on to Belmont. This Philadelphia story continues its magical way to the elusive Triple Crown. Rock hard ten was second. It was close for third. The final time was one minute 55 and two fifth seconds. This is special. He was a terrific racehorse, and that Preakness, after watching him dominate a Churchill and to come back 14 days later to do what he did there, I'm going, this is it. This is the one we've been waiting for, and things three weeks from that time didn't work out per se, even though the horse ran giant in the Belmont. Any quick uh, Smarty Jones memories with you? My father was a huge fan. He was on him from the start of his racing career, so it was a little bit of a hard beat on Belmont Day in the Hello household. Yeah, yeah, and all of Philadelphia. I mean, there's that famous picture, I think, taken at Philly Philadelphia Park, which is now parks of, uh, you know, the fans right after they hit the wire. But a terrific racehorse. And uh, look, we've got a new chapter coming up, a 13-horse uh, field, the biggest Preakness cast since back in 2011, drawn uh, late yesterday afternoon slash early evening up in Baltimore. And a very uh, wide-open race, Pete, led, of course, by trainer Bob Baffert and his improbable as Bob, believe it or not, is looking for an unprecedented eighth career win in the second jewel the triple crown i'll give you i'll give you a quick trivia question for you do you think this race is won by a new shooter or somebody from the derby i'm gonna take i'm gonna take i think of the two the more popular answer is gonna be by one of the derby also rands that's that's what i'm gonna that's my answer here about you know two days out from the race i say the opposite so yeah a little, I had little, a little separation well good i'm looking forward to again with the surface switch today and uh, and coming back off the uh, three-day layoff if you will kind of scrambling this morning we'll talk more in depth about the preakness uh, tomorrow and certainly on a saturday morning here on gulfstream today but we got to move on to the opening leg of today's uh, 1.1 million dollar or close to that jackpot rainbow six carryover Pretty modest play on a on an off the turf 
a good and sealed uh, Thursday afternoon to start. I'm ten dollars and uh, and eighty cents here with two singles and two uh, two chocolate bars, as they say, between the seven <laughs> Malibu Rainbow and the number uh, in race number eight, the number ten. Royal Asher. Yeah, looks pretty good. Got the outside uh, post. I don't and know speed. about all that. All right, well, <laughs> we got to pick up the pace. I know we came on a little late because we finally got odds again. It was kind of a hectic morning here locally in Howlandale Beach, but there's my play for ten dollars and eighty cents. I respect the two you have to hopefully cash out a winning early pick five in Escondera and a lock the potential. However, I'm taking an angle that you've clearly liked so far today. Hopefully seven gems can just get to the lead and, and never look back. Or if he doesn't make the point, can sit outside and overmatch Chief White Sox. Well, he's resuming from a freshening. That could be good or bad. It depends on the way you interpret that. There is some other speed in here. Chief White Sox and Farley is going to be forwardly placed as well. Listen, the, everybody in this race has questions and and frankly, I don't know that we all have the answers to those questions. Mm -hmm. No doubt about that. You're uh, towards the outside. I'm going to take seven gems. We'll see what shakes out in the fifth. Late pick five, meanwhile, gets underway. We're off the turf. First finish line race at eight and a half furlongs coming up. Second half of the card. What's this pick five looking like? Uh, well, I, I respect your horse in the eighth, by the way. The solid single is the other horse you singled in Malibu Rainbow in the seventh race. I think this race is a two-horse contest. There's only two horses that have any dirt for him to speak of. Malibu Rainbow should win. I'd love to hear a reason why not. I, I like number seven, Balada, a little bit in the eighth race. I'm a fan of hers, though. I always have been. She's one of those horses that likes to get hooked. Mm -hmm. And so I'll see if I can take it to Royal Asher early, who I think freaked last time. Four deep in the ninth race. I hope I have the right four. That's a really good betting race. And then in the tenth race, they took the lock of the day out. Number four, she'll do. Scratched as the main track is now in use here. So I'll use Piano Forte and Forever Marta and then the outside horse, the 13 Boca Royalty. Hope those are the right three. I'm confident early. Mm -hmm. Ironically, the races I worry about are the races I'm deepest in. Well, there you go. I mean, the irony is uh, pretty stunning, as they say, but I get <laughs> you're not confident. You, you think Malibu Rainbow is going to be tough for Sappy in the seven, so why not spread it in a $24 play? We've got the Deuce, Nunk Pro Tunk, and the Fork Tactical Quality. Two very different looking horses on paper, but you said it. They're the dirt horses. Yeah, I'm old. Nunk Pro Tunk ran huge Big last race. time. I didn't, uh, I mean, I was uh, shocked A, at how well he ran, and B, how much money he took for first start since last May. Is he a bounce candidate? Sure, I guess. I love the four on the barn change here, though. Tactical quality. He's going to be at the mercy of the pace scenario in here mm -hmm. because he has no tactical quality at all. Yeah, no he doubt. comes from way back. But just strictly on the fact that he is a main track horse and a field full of turf horses, I'll go for him on top. All right, field of five there in race number six. As we move on to the seventh here, scheduled dirt race coming up. Three and up Phillies and Mares in this near 50K maiden special weight. And it looked like even if we were on the turf today, it looked like Safi had a legit chance at winning at least three races on the card uh, with Rudiger out and uh, and again the wet conditions Malibu Rainbow is the horse from the barn though that I think most people are going to say look she could just be a little too good for these. Well last time out she lost to Angelia who was about two to five in that particular race so when you consider that and she only got beat two lengths to her and who at the time was a very well regarded filly from the Pletcher Shed Row find me somebody to beat this race. I mean she's two to five looking at this race. I right agree. Now. But and the thing is, is that, you know, I'm, I'm sure that everybody has their own theories about how to handicap, but mm -hmm. I establish who the favorite's going to be and then try to take an argument that I like to beat them. Right. I can't make an argument against Malibu Rainbow, so there you go. No, she does look like a layover against that field, and she can stay. She's a grinder, and maybe over a wet the track. The post you go, draw is so good. No, the post draw works for her. And my original thought was, well, will somebody maybe get away with a quick turn of foot or a spurt? She can stay the distance, though, in a mile, one turn mile on the dirt for the other. It really looks like it. Chocolate bar. Yeah, you got it. Back-to-back <laughs> -back chocolate bars for me, actually. No, 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 no. Balada's going to spoil your eight. party. All right, well, you can talk about Balada. I am just, again, not reinventing the wheel. You've got an eight-time winner, six times on dirt, an eight-time winner all together. For my man, Gustavo Delgado, who's going to try to shock the world. He's got Royal Asher, of course, and he's got uh, the maiden, Bodie Express and the Preakness on Saturday. Well, I guess they must have gone back and retimed this race. I can tell you this. When I was in the booth calling Royal Asher's last race, I wasn't buying those fractions that are put up. I still don't know that I buy them. Three quarters and eight? This is a horse who wasn't even a speed horse until last time. This just has to me, like, I mean, 
I, Gustavo does a great job, don't get me wrong, but if there's ever a horse right. on the planet that stands to regress off of a huge run last mm -hmm. time, this is the one. And now the good news is, is there's not much in there. That's what you were getting ready right. to yeah, say. Of course. Except, except number seven, Balata. She's keeping good company across the state, and she does have some tactical speed. She doesn't need the lead, and she's a horse that's up for a fight. The horse she lost against last time out, Cool Kate, is stakes quality in Illinois. So I, I, I will think she stacks up pretty well here. Now some good points, and she likes a wet track. I would imagine, assuming we get no more rain, and that's always a big if here this time of the year in this part of the country, we'll be dealing with the main track that'll steadily dry out throughout the first few races. Moving on to the ninth, my friend, we'll do the late double quickly. 12-5-3 and up claimers. 7-2-6-5 for me in this race. I didn't know where to go. Um, I'm just going to take Passionate Hachi. I've seen much like Angel Kiros. I think Fernando Abreu's horses of late have run okay. And uh, so horse that albeit has run pretty well here in context that he's going what I think is a demanding one turn mile. Well, the one thing I like about Passionate Hachi that I can say in your corner is, is that this horse did something that I love here at Gulfstream Park was racing into a deadly second quarter. Anytime the second quarter is significantly faster than the first here at Gulfstream Park and you're on the pace of that, chuck them out. Mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of in terms of giving them an alibi for the for their next race. So I, I think that makes sense. Zalza is a wild card. I think he's his own worst enemy. Does he get the mile? Does he try to come from behind again? What in the world does he try to do? Why trust is the sneaky taking a huge class drop off of a barn change last time out back to reality here today. His race is two and three starts ago. Plenty good enough. Oh, absolutely. He's a must use in here and we're fans of Bob the bone. It does a good job. Race 10. Meanwhile, off the turf field of 11. You do get some size in this one and look the the 11 horse cast may going in may really put it up against the number 13 Boca royalty her margin for error might be slight she's the horse to beat though because she's run I'm going to argue she's run nearly as good as the five forever Marta if not a little better on the dirt and specifically that dirt race most recently because it was going a mile on the main track. I'm going to take her. Well, the winner, Chicky the Gray, was loose on the lead that day when making a substantial class drop. So that's good news if you like Boca Royalty. Forever Marta's last time out was second behind Uncaptured Angel, who was a winner and expected to do so from Safi Joseph Shedro. So the parallels are similar. I'll go for the six, Piano Forte. She lost to a two to five winner herself in Purple Girl last time out. She does look to me like a horse that wants more ground. She gets it here today. And class-wise, she might have a little bit of an edge on a couple of these. That's a good point by Creative Cause. More than ready, damn. A uh, two-turn, my own a 16th. And as you like to say, a first finish line race. I will say be it in for years. myself so I don't get burned more than anything else. Well, there's no such thing as Pete Aiello getting burned. In fact, you'll knock it out of the park with the scratches and changes. And I'll see everybody downstairs shortly before race one.